So we are really very fortunate tonight to have a guest visiting us all the way from California digitally. Um, Rachel Biel, uh, Biel is joining us to talk about a new memoir that she wrote. Uh, so just to give you a little background about Rachel and then I'll turn it over to her. Uh, Rachel Biel grew up in Israel on a kibbutz on the bank um, on the bank of the Jordan River. After finishing high school and her IDF service, she came to the US for her university education. She received her BA and MA in Jewish history from UCLA and her master's of social work from Yeshiva University. Rachel is a clinical social worker and San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area Jewish community professional. Uh, she's also a parenting consultant. Uh, Rachel's other books include The Pathbreaking Women and Jewish Law in 1984 and the forthcoming What Now? Two Minute Tips for Solving Common Parenting Challenges, uh, expected in June of 2020. And with that, I will turn it over to Rachel. Great. So thank you so much. Uh, Shira has exchanged many emails with me to get this set up, so I really, really appreciate it. And of course, thanks to Rina and David for getting the ball rolling. David and I met, I don't know if we met in 1970, in, in February 71 when I came to Berkeley for a few days, but certainly by 72 uh, when uh, David was in Israel and I was a soldier in the IDF protecting the homeland, but mainly to be honest with you, carrying on a passionate uh, love, relationship with David who and we then got married in uh, March 1973 and David was there and the then other, he, a different David a different there are a lot of Davids in that generation so there's that David Lichtenstein is your David and my David is David Beale and there were other Davids uh anyway and then I met Rina when we were in Binghamton and you came up and uh we had already been married for several years, so we felt like we knew what the business was about, and it was just thrilling to meet Rina, and here we are. So I'm gonna talk about my book, Growing Up Below Sea Level, A Kibbutz Childhood. As Shira said, my kibbutz is on the banks of the Jordan River in the uh, big crevasse, really, in the uh, geographical, from Syria all the way to Africa, which the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, and the Dead Sea are all in. And from a little bit north of our kibbutz, the gap of the Jordan River goes below sea level, down to the lowest point on Earth, which is the Dead Sea. Um, so we were not the lowest kibbutz on Earth. Kibbutz and Gedi, which is by the Dead Sea, was a little lower, but other than that, we were extremely proud of it. We thought it was amazing that we were 238 meters below sea level. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about how we're going to run this session, and then I'll plunge right in. So I'm going to do a short, I'm assuming that everybody on this Zoom call knows what a kibbutz is, knows a little bit about the history of Israel, and et cetera. So we're going to not have to go to that part. I'm going to do a short, uh, PowerPoint presentation because I think it's helpful to have visual images as the background to the word images that I'm going to create through the next part, which will be reading two very short stories with a little bit of skipping to give you a flavor of what the stories are like. Uh, and then we'll have an open conversation. The other thing I want to say very briefly is about how the book is constructed. So the book is primarily short stories about my childhood from my earliest memory, which is from age three, uh, to the period in 1973 after my marriage when I left uh, the kibbutz and came to the United States to study uh, at university. And the short stories are kind of linked into each other in the sense that one person appears in one story as the main character and in two or three other stories, you see him as a secondary yes. character. Uh, the idea being that through the stories and through the characters and through some of the details about our everyday life, you get a kind of a tapestry of what kibbutz, was, kibbutz life was like in the 50s and the 60s. And 
it's uh, certainly a reality that doesn't exist anymore. And we can talk in the Q&A about how it changed, um, really starting in the 70s. But during my childhood, it was very much a fervently ideological community, very strong collective ideology of uh, communal ownership, uh, no private property to speak of. Uh, and the sort of hallmark for a lot of people who visited the kibbutz or have read about it, the children lived in children's houses and slept in the children's houses uh, and only spent about four or five hours each day with their parents in the parents' room. When I put all these stories together and worked with an editor, she said, you know, these stories really portray a great picture of this community, but you're gonna have readers who don't know about the kibbutz and who don't really know that much about the history of the state of Israel. They're gonna read about these people and think they were crazy um, to um, create this utopian, uh, rather um, coercive, in, ideologically coercive society. So you really have to nestle your story in the bigger story of how your parents got there to begin with both the sort of idealistic dreams when they were in the youth movement in Prague, Czechoslovakia, but more importantly, the six year saga my parents went through, which maybe we'll have time to when we get into the question, having left Prague in December, 1939, and in the case of my mother, only arriving in Palestine in August, 1945. So uh, the first part of the story kind of captures that story briefly. I had the um, lucky situation that my mother started, started the diary on the day that she left her parents in the Masaryk train station in Prague. And the book starts with her di diary entry describing the train pulling out of the station and her parents receding into the distance. And her, you know, a naive part of her saying, oh, you know, I'll see them one way or the other, and another part of her having at least a premonition that maybe she won't, and she didn't. Um, and then uh, chronicling their uh, perilous journey through the Mediterranean and then being deported by the British to Mauritius where they were imprisoned, I have all of that in her diary. Then when my mother finally arrived in Palestine in 1945, she and my father met up. They had known each other since they were teenagers, but they were not a romantic couple. Even though if you read my mother's diary closely, you could see that she already had her eye on him. But he had other girlfriends, so. Um, and they just fell in love with each other sort of on the spot. Of course, they had a lot that they had in common. And they started corresponding because my father had arrived in Palestine in 1943 by volunteering to serve in the British Army. So they had to write letters. They did have a few dates between August 45 and July 46 when he was finally released, uh, discharged from the British Army. But mostly there's about 100 letters that they wrote to each other, sometimes three times a day. And fortunately for me, because of course their shared language was Czech, which I don't speak. And my mother's diary was in Czech and we had it translated by a professional translator. But because my father was a soldier and the British army did not provide censors who could read Czech, they had to write in, where well, they were permitted to write in English, German or French. So of course, even though my parents were completely fluent in German from home, of course they wouldn't write in, Fr in German because of what the Nazis had done to German. Their French was kind of rusty because they had had it in high school along with, of course, Latin and ancient Greek, but it wasn't really that um, fresh. And they did know English, my father, mostly from serving in the British army and functioning in everyday life. And my mother, as a prisoner in Mauritius, decided that, well, maybe she should learn English. She took a book out of the library that the British uh, officials had set up for the prisoners. I should mention there were about 1,500 prisoners in this prison, British prison. Um, and she said, I just read it five times with a dictionary from beginning to end. I would finish it, start over. and. By the time I finished it for the first time, my English was pretty fluent. 
Uh, and in fact, she spent the rest of her adult li life reading preferably in English actually over Hebrew, even though of course she knew Hebrew. So that's the first part of the book. And then it goes into the stories and I'm going to now read you two uh, of the very short ones from my early childhood. Um, okay, good. Clean sheets. Wake up, wake up. My blanket yanked off my face, I opened my eyes. In the fresh light of dawn, I saw Ronnie and Dahlia pressed up against my bed. Why? What? what? It happened again, Ronnie whispered. It happened again, I repeated as I came around to full awareness. You know, to Sami, Dahlia said. We never said the actual words. I got up quickly and smoothed down my blanket. Let's go, I said. We turned towards the far corner of the room where Sami was perched on the edge of his bed, hunched under his blanket. He was pulling the ends of the blanket under his chin so tightly, you saw only his eyes and half his nose. We were certainly efficient for four-year-olds. We had had plenty of practice. This happened at least once a week. Sami was the last one in our class of 11, five girls and six boys who still had this problem. No one ever talked about it. Not the three of us who shared his room, nor the kids from the other rooms who occasionally woke up early and saw us in action. Not the grown-ups either, neither the metapelet, the caretaker, nor anyone's parents. Did they even know? Did Sami's parents know? Was there a conspiracy of silence or mere ignorance? I rushed to the room leading to the showers where clean laundry was kept in two rows of triple cubbies. The lower row was for bottom sheets, slip covers for blankets and pajamas. I grabbed one of each. The second tier had one compartment for underwear, one for shirts and one for pants, but I didn't need any of those now. I carried my bundle back to the room. I knew Ronnie and Dahlia had already stripped Sami's bed by the smell in the doorway. Slightly pungent with a chemical quality I did not know the name for yet. Though it wasn't terribly strong, I experienced it as overpowering. Not in my nose, but in my heart. Shame on Sami's behalf. As if it were an entity standing on its own right there in the middle of the room. I put my bundle on the floor and without a word took the blanket from Sami's hand. Ronnie held onto the edges of the blanket while Dahlia and I tugged on the opposite corners of the slipcover. It was a hard job under normal circumstances, but with the large damp spot in the middle, it took all our strength. It was as if the wet patch didn't want to part from the cozy warmth of the blanket. Meanwhile, Sami stood on to the side, shivering in his wet pajamas. I handed him the clean pair. Quick, I said, and put the wet pajamas on top of the wet sheets. I said as I turned back to help Roni and Dalia drag the recalcitrant blanket out. Finally, the blanket released the cover and Dalia and I set to maneuvering it into the fresh one. Roni rolled the wet bedding and pajamas into a tight wad. Push it to the very bottom of the dirty laundry bin, I said as he dragged the wet roll along the floor by its only dry corner heading towards the shower room. I know, he said, and make sure there is enough laundry on top of it so you can't smell it. I couldn't help acting as if I were in charge. I know that too, Ronnie said. I've done it enough times. He rounded the doorpost to the laundry. We better hurry, I said to Dahlia as we lay down the clean bottom sheet over the thin mattress, smoothing it across the middle. Yes, she said, we better finish before the others wake up. Or the metapellet comes, I added. Ronnie came back and helped us with the final tugs on the slip cover until the blanket was all the way in and we managed to do the buttons that closed its open mouth. Sami lay down on his bed and we covered him up. 
He was still shivering, so I tucked the blanket around him. Pretend you're asleep, Roni instructed everyone as we slipped into our own beds and pulled the covers up to our chin. A moment later, we all heard the footsteps of the metapellet approaching the front door. Years later, when Sami was drafted joining a highly selective combat unit, I saw him after the first week of basic training. How's it going? How are you holding up? I asked. Good. It's not as hard as I was led to believe. The discipline, the endless push-ups, you know. Great. The first night, though, he stopped and his face got red. What? Sammy hesitated and stared at his feet, shaking his head. Then he took a big gulp of air. It came back. The first night on the base. I could have used you and the others from our kindergarten room. And because of the time we lost, I'm going to paraphrase most of the next story, so we have plenty of time to, for the discussion. And this one is called Rice Pudding. I'll just read the very beginning, I'll summarize, and then I'll jump over to the end. You'll stay right here in your chair until you eat it. The kindergarten metapellet towered over me at the children's dining table. Unlike a regular caretaker who was short, round, and jolly, this one was broom thin, tall, and stern. Her elbows were so bony and her starch ironed apron so spotless that I was definitely intimidated. But I huddled over my bowl, sucked in my upper lip, and crossed my arms tightly on my chest. Hurry now, she said. I shook my head. Always so stubborn, she muttered to herself, then raised her voice. The others want to go home already. It's already five minutes after four. You, you are holding them up. Out of the corner of my eye, I took a peek at my 10 classmates already lined up by the door, ready to go to their parents' homes for the afternoon and evening. So, the metaparent opens the door and she says, okay, children, you can all go home, and Racheli will stay here until she eats her rice pudding. Now, the crazy thing is that rice pudding was actually considered a big treat because it came in this kind of well, I, I still can't eat it, to be honest. But it was this white glob with uh, berry syrup, of course, ersatz, kind of oozing over it. And it was given in the afternoon snack before we went to our parents' home as a treat. Now, this is the time when Israel was undergoing very severe recession. There wasn't quite enough food. Um, so the rule was you had to eat everything on your plate except that for some reason, the kibbutz was already liberalizing a little bit. And the rule was that each child was allowed to have one dish that they didn't like and they wouldn't have to eat. So of course, most of the kids picked spinach because you know what it looks like when it comes out of a can. But I somehow ate that spinach just so that I could refuse to eat the rice pudding. Why? I don't know. Maybe I was already developing some of my iconoclastic personality, which I inherited from my parents. Anyway, so she uh, told all the kids to go home. They all went home. Um, and she was standing there tapping her foot. I wouldn't touch the rice pudding. And finally, after a few more minutes, she said, well, I'm going home. I'm done. She opened the door. She looked one more time to see if I would eat it. And she left. And there was I in the kindergarten room all by myself, staring at the bowl of rice pudding and not knowing what exactly I could do, but I certainly wasn't going to eat it. And after what at the time seemed to me like two or three hours, but probably it was 25 minutes, the door opens and my mother enters the kindergarten and she says, oh, thank God you're here. I was worried. And she said, sit, sees me and she says, now I'm going to go back to uh, the story. She sat down next to me. What happened here? I won't. A torrent of tears burst out. My mother took me in her arms and waited. Finally catching my breath between whimpers and sniffles, I told her what the metabellet had said and done. 
It's not right, I cried. It sure isn't, my mother said. Come with me. She took my sweaty palm in one hand and picked up the bowl of rice pudding in the other. She marched us, me and the bowl, of, and the bowl to the bathroom. With a dramatic flourish, she dumped the rice pudding into the toilet. She let go of my hand and yanked the metal chain dangling from the water bowl that hung high above, which we called the Niagara, the Niagara, that old style toilet. Justice had prevailed, rolling like great waters, righteousness like a mighty stream. Years later, standing in the cold mist at the observation deck, deck I was floored by the real Niagara, but not quite as much as I had been by my mother's actions that day. Okay, so let's uh, unmute, let's just have a conversation. Um, Shira, should we just have people visually raise their hand and they can, un you call on them and they can unmute themselves? Let's do it that way and see how it works. So any questions? So a lot of you have uh, hidden your video and then we can't see if you want to ask a question. So unless you're totally naked, just put the video back on. So any questions for about uh, growing up on a kibbutz in the highly ideological early days of um, the mid 20th century? Go ahead, Rena. Oh. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, actually, this, this is a little bit of a cheat because I was on a Zoom where Racheli did a reading a while back and somebody else asked this question. I thought it was a really interesting question, um, which was, you know, having grown up in a children's house and that experience, and now you're a social worker and a parent counseling expert, how do you think that impacted what you do now and where you are now yeah. as um, you know, a parenting counselor? Right. Okay, so let me start by saying that you and I are both therapists. So it surely impacted me more than I'm fully conscious of. That's a given. Um, I think that one of the things that's very clear to me in thinking about my childhood, I should sort of put this in a bigger context, that there are many people who grew up on a kibbutz uh, who experienced it either at the time or certainly in hindsight as adults is very traumatizing. What you say in my book, in my book if you read it, is that even though that metapellet made me eat the rice pudding and abandon me by myself, it wasn't traumatizing. It was actually empowering because I knew I was right. And then my mother came and she confirmed that I was right. And she showed me what you do when the big collective system uh, steps on you and steps on what is right. So I think that what uh, I got from that in terms of my own parenting and my counseling is that there are many factors that go into the question of how a child will uh, develop through their childhood and how they'll experience it at the time and how they will then think back about on it when they are an adult. Um, you would think on some level that being raised like this in such a completely different uh, environment and in theology would create a completely different person than what you would expect here. But that in fact is not the case. I think that certainly in my case, the most profound influence was my parents. Um, at the same time, I think what I took from that experience, which I, in my counseling with parents, try to help parents find how to translate into the child rearing environment here, which is so isolating in a way because so much of it is around the, just the small nuclear family, is this tremendous sense of mutual responsibility so at four years old, we already understood that it was our job to take care of our classmate and protect him from the shame of the other kids knowing or the grown-ups knowing that he wet his bed. 
um, that sense of mutual responsibility is something that I've carried with myself into my adult life. So I try to help parents find ways within their own family and then their family within the community uh, that they can create opportunities for their child to feel that sense of responsibility. That sense of responsibility in order for that to work, it actually has to come along with a sense of agency because we had that overpowering sense of responsibility, but we also felt that we could do it, which is kind of crazy when you think about it in terms of contemporary child rain culture that four-year-old kids can take care of that kind of business on their own. So in my parenting, uh, my own parenting experience and my work with parents, I try to help them look at their how they've structured their lives in their children's lives and place much more responsibility and agency in their kids' hands to grow up with and to enrich their own sense of self and their own sense of connection to the, to the community. That said, did I wish that my kids uh, slept in a children's house away from me every night while I was raising them? No, absolutely not. I, find it hard to imagine how my parents and their whole generation accepted that. Um, of course, the range of possibilities was very different. Uh, on the other hand, there are certainly um, sometimes when having free babe childcare every night of the week seems quite attractive. So I try to kind of uh, find ways to help parents who are raising the kids really on their own in nuclear families to create a little mini village uh, and to create more opportunities for being supported by other parents, uh, whether it would be uh, the, the parents who are, whose kids are in the same uh, daycare or neighbors or extended family. Um, those are opportunities that, that allow parents to have more time as adults. Uh, and that I think are very instructive experiences for children that other people, other grown-ups, can take good care of them. And of course, there's babysitters and childcare workers, etc. But the experience I grew up in the, with on the kibbutz, which I, I guess I bemoan that American children don't have, is a sense that it's totally safe out there. So we were left in the kindergarten room at the same time as those clean sheets and the rice pudding. At the end of the evening that we spent with our parents, so it would be about 7.30, quarter to eight, our parents would bring us back to the, to the kindergarten. They'd help you put on your pajama, take you to brush your teeth, tuck you in your uh, bed and read you one very short stories and then all the parents would leave. And shortly after all the parents left, the metapellet would sort of go from room to room and make sure that as far as she knew, everybody was asleep. And then she would leave. So by now it's maybe 8.20, 8.30. And of course, none of us were asleep. And then around 10.30 or 11, a kibbutz member whose uh, turn had come up because there was a rotation among all the adults, including people who were not parents and knew nothing about young kids. Somebody would sleep in the kindergarten house from about 10.30 or 11 until four in the morning when they would get up and go to work. So between 8.30 and 10.30, it was complete pandemonium. And the fact that nobody got injured, maimed, killed is kind of miraculous. On the other hand, we felt like it was perfectly fine because if something had happened, let's say somebody banged his head on the doorpost because we had a, a sport where we would jump from a window that had a kind of a windowsill that you could actually crouch in we would jump from there onto a pillow on the, on the tile floor and then slide out the front door of the room. And the doorposts were sometimes in the way. So we knew that if somebody did that and banged their head on the door frame, some, one of us would just run outside and call out and a grown up would come and take care of the situation. So that's, uh, that's an experience that unfortunately cannot be reproduced in our current environment and current culture, uh, but I try to help parents see whether there are small capsules of that that they can create. And I guess the final thing that, that did not appear in these stories, but a very important part of my childhood on the kibbutz was working, doing manual labor. So starting already in kindergarten, we had our own 
little vegetable gardens and chickens and we helped clean the, the kindergarten. And by third grade, we were given the privilege in the summer of working in real kibbutz branches. So one of my proudest moments was in third grade, I got assigned to the dairy cows. And I remember extremely vividly that somebody thought it was perfectly reasonable to send me a third grade girl, you know, maybe four foot high, maybe 90 pounds, to bring the 120 dairy cows back from pasture to the milking parlor. I took a stick because I was a little bit nervous, but I did it. So that kind of experience, again, of mastery and of, of being able to actually do manual labor was a very enriching part. And it's hard to reproduce, but I encourage parents to have a garden, to have their child do work in the house. By the way, that's something that's coming up now a lot with COVID-19. People are sequestered in their home all day and parents feel that they have to entertain their kids all day. And one of the best things they can do is actually give them jobs that are useful and important for the family's functioning, whether it be sorting, recycling, emptying the dishwasher, running the vacuum cleaner, real jobs, not not just entertainment. Anyway, that was a very long answer to a short question. Okay. I, I, any I, I just wanted to say that David pointed out, and he's right, while you were talking, that that pandemonium, but also that feeling that other parents um, can be in charge is very similar to, I think, what our shul experience is mm -hmm. with, with little children. That Running around. Mm -hmm. Right. Where so that, that yeah, yeah. So that's like a capsule that the shul can create a, a moment. And there's a way that kids play when they feel that freedom that's different than when they're in a structured daycare or play, play date situation. So right. we, yeah. we would come to shul, our, our girls were um, five and, and seven, and they would be off. We wouldn't see them for a few hours. And they they functioned as independent entities of us, as, as their own selves within that, that sort of safe area, that very large mm -hmm. point of view. Right. And, and they was, didn't have cell phones. Right. There were no cell phones. Then. Right. Right. Thank, thankfully, because obviously on some practical level, it makes perfect sense for kids to have cell phones so they can call for help. But the subliminal message is that you're never able to be on your own because you're always going to need to have this gadget that will connect you to your parents. And the experience of being on your own is very empowering. On the other hand, so uh, fortunately for me, my mother lived to age 95, and she read many of these stories. And she, after she read a few of them about kindergarten, she says to me, what were we thinking leaving you unsupervised for hours at a time? And then she said, but you all turned out fine. So I guess it wasn't that bad. So there is that sort of sense of the two sides of the same coin. OK, anyone else with a question or a comment? Or if you yourself had been on a kibbutz as a volunteer, if you had similar experiences to share. I wonder, um, obviously, you experienced it from the perspective of a child. Um, but kind of hooking into what, something you were saying about, you know, that it was, it could be kind of nice having regular childcare, but in a bigger sense, was there sort of an empowerment of the mothers, of the women um, that occurred having truly, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can't say inequality because I, you know, but a, a greater sense of, um, of, you know, liberation from the primary responsibility of child care. Yeah. So I would say that was the ideology and that was something that the founders of the kibbutz movement in general and the, the system of collective education touted as one of its great gifts. In reality, the liberation of women was very superficial. So women continue to perform the same kind of domestic functions that they perform in a traditional gender unequal family, except for the community as a whole. So all the cooking, cleaning, 
washing, mending, and childcare was done by women. In my childhood, there was not a single man who worked in the children's houses or in the dining room or in the communal laundry. Um, and as far as positions of leadership within the community, the, some extraordinary women in my kibbutz and in other kibbutzim did become as powerful leaders within their own kibbutz and actually eventually within the kibbutz movement. But it was the exception rather than the rule. So women, I would say, in the as early as the first kibbutz in Daganya in, uh, in 1910, but certainly by the 50s and the 60s when there were larger communities and there were a lot of children, uh, women were not, did not have equal power to men in terms of the functioning on the kibbutz, in terms of making decisions, etc. That said, certain women like my mother um, were able to, in some ways, take all of the positive things of the system, but at the same time, uh, when they felt that the system was wrong, like in the rice pudding story, they, uh, my mother and a few other women, but for the, not the majority, were able to say, the community is wrong, I'm right. So for example, uh, when my older brother, who was born in February of 48, so before the War of Independence, or right, before the declaration of the state and the War of Independence, my, he was born, my mother came home from the hospital and put him in the Beit Inokot, in the baby house. And um, that's what it was. And then he got sick when he was maybe a couple months old. So she, and he had a fever. So she took him home to take care of him at home at night. The Kibbutz Asefa, the General Assembly that met every Saturday night, officially censured her for breaking the rules. And I talked to her about it like 30 years later. And I said, how was that? The whole kibbutz basically reprimanding you officially for taking care of your baby. And she said, well, it was not easy, but it was not the last time that I went against the grain. And I knew I was right and they were wrong. And that's what kept me going. So some women had that very strong independent kind of thinking, but I would say the majority of women sort of went along with the routine, which, uh, as I said, did not give them equal footing with the men. Yeah, Ruthie, or Ruthie's iPad. So who is supposed to take care of the baby when he's sick, when he's two months old? The, 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 Okay, so when the, there's a caretaker. I mean, you know, this, here you're talking about feeding him, breastfeeding him, taking care of him. How does he, how did, I, I'm from Israel. So okay. I've been to a kibbutz and I, I didn't live in a kibbutz, but I've been and I've seen. But yeah. those little articles, I never thought about. How does one take care of, of, of what necessity? Right, so the, the children's houses, starting with the baby house, were staffed by women who had been sent to, tra to a training in childcare. On my kibbutz, I don't know if this was a general rule, the, f the philosophy was that it was actually women who did not have their own children who were best suited to be the caretaker because they didn't have their own emotional baggage and they wouldn't favor their own child, etc. And some of them were very good and some of them really were not up to the job. Uh, but basically, there would be a caretaker in the baby house or in the children's house all day. Then, as I said, from roughly 4 to 7.30 or 8, depending on your age, you were with your parents. And then you were brought back when in the baby house there was a caretaker who put all the babies to sleep. So parents did not have to deal with the fact that some babies woke up frequently and the caretaker would give them a bottle. Uh, this is also the time of, of um, Skinner in terms of child uh, rearing. So it was fairly rigid, the four hour in Dr. Spock. Baby is supposed to be fed every four hours. So every four hours, either the care caretaker would give them a bottle or if the mother wanted to come and either breastfeed or give a bottle, the night watch woman who went around the kibbutz from one children's house to the next where the children were a little older 
would wake you up every four hours and you'd, you know, sort of stumble into some clothes and go up to the baby house and feed your child and then go back to your own house to sleep. So it was um, very trying for the mothers, very difficult. More difficult for the mothers and for the kids. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about the children before. I'm, I teach kindergarten, first grade, and second grade in a mm -hmm. private school in Manhattan. And I find the kids to be so, um, have no sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, you know, it comes from being so um, over-programmed and over-indulged and nothing, you know, and, and not having high expectations. And in my experience, it causes a lot of anxiety. So mm -hmm. if they're not directed even for a few minutes, they'll say, um, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? <laughs> so, you know, I think there has to be a happy medium. That right. <laughs> right, right. You're probably not going to propose that your child care now have the teachers leave for two hours every day. Mm -hmm. and then come back and see what happens. But both in the childcare setting and at home, there are certainly a lot more opportunities for having the kids be in charge. So for example, so my granddaughter in Brooklyn is in a wonderful daycare. Uh, and the rule there is after your snack, you have to clear your little mat and your dishes. That's great. But why aren't the kids, kids wiping down the tables and washing the communal bowls? Well, now with Corona, it's going to be a different thing. But before Corona, on each table, there was a bowl that had either sliced fruit or crackers. The children clearing those and washing them. Um, the, on one day, we could be cleanup day, and you know, the kids should be cleaning the toys. Uh, and if, a child, if it's childcare that has an outdoor space, which is hard to find in New York, uh, but here in Berkeley, most of them do, there should be a, a garden day. First of all, there should be a vegetable garden, but second of all, there should be a cleaning day where the kids rake and pull weeds and clean the yard. Uh, and the same thing at home, obviously on a smaller scale, but I encourage parents to rethink all the things that need to get done in the daily life of a family and also on the weekly cycle and even on the monthly cycle and think about what of those jobs could their kids do. And of course, it varies according to age. Uh, but um, even a three-year-old can run a vacuum cleaner. Maybe they don't actually do a great job. So after they're asleep, you can run it again. But they should have the job of running the vacuum cleaner. And they should have the job of unloading the dishwasher, at least not the breakable stuff, and putting it back on a shelf. Um, so I very much encourage teachers and, and parents to really rethink. And I think that some of them that I've, I've been doing some support groups with parents and early childhood directors, they're beginning to realize that this is something that's really missing from the lives of children. Right, there was such an emphasis on reading early and, and math, things like that, and not life skills and right. Mm -hmm. right. responsibility. Yeah. Okay, anybody else with a question or a comment? Deborah Weinberger. Yeah, it's Jay, the other half. Um, what, what, what do you think uh, were some of the factors that led to the decline of the, uh, of the kibbutz culture in Israel? In, out, in the kibbutz or outside the kibbutz? No, that led to the decline over the years of the, uh, of the kibbutz culture in Israel. Right. So, so there's two things that happened sort of in tandem. One is that kibbutzim themselves changed. So starting in the 70s, well, starting really in the 60s and much accelerated after the Six-Day War because Israel altogether went through a process of becoming much more open to American culture, partly, by the way, because of volunteers. Uh, and much more consumer oriented and much more capitalist. So there's, there are big processes in Israel as a whole and the kibbutz is part of it. Um, but as the generation of people who grew up like my, co my cohort or slightly older than me, as they became adults and became parents on the kibbutz, they didn't want the children sleeping in the children's houses anymore. 
for several reasons. One of them being that some of them found it traumatizing. And, that, and the other one is that many of them wanted their kids closer. Uh, and also the kibbutzim were joined by many people who grew up in the city who came to the kibbutzim through the youth movements and the army service. And um, ideology in general was just gradually becoming a weaker and weaker factor and people wanted to do what felt more comfortable and natural. So starting in the early 70s and into the 90s, the kibbutz communal sleeping and and incredibly strong communal child rearing um, basically fell apart. In some kibbutzim it was very uh, difficult and contentious and in others it was more gradual and eventually there's as far as I know there's not a single kibbutz today where kids under the age of let's say 13 or 14 don't sleep at home. They all sleep at home. Following that in the 90s and the early 2000s there was a process of of partial privatization on most kibbutzim, where the complete equality and the complete uh, uh, absence of any kind of monetary system within the kibbutz was also dismantled. So most kibbutzim to ha today have a partial privatization where people do get differential salaries depending on what kind of job they do in the kibbutz. The differences between the highest paid person on the kibbutz and the lowest paid person on the kibbutz is still only about 30 or 40 percent. So it's nothing like our country, but nevertheless, there are now differences in salaries and in therefore in lifestyle and people have private cars and people can have private bank accounts, uh, etc. So that has changed the kibbutz internally. What changed the uh, cultural impact of the kibbutz in Israel primarily was the demise of the Labour Party as the um, um, what's the word I'm looking for hegemonic cult political and ideological culture of Israel and the Likud Party mm -hmm. when Begin came to power uh, he stoked animosity towards the kibbutz movement uh, as a political maneuver. Uh, to appeal to people in primarily people of working class and poor neighborhoods, primarily in the development towns. Uh, and some of that animosity was um, deployed basically just for political gain. Uh, and some of it was somewhat justified in the sense that, for example, in my case, we were only six miles away from the town of Beit Shan, which was populated by Moroccan Jews who came to Israel in the 50s and were essentially dumped there, to be perfectly blunt about it, uh, without the kind of communal structure they had in Morocco, without access to the kind of professions that they had in Morocco, which were primarily all kinds of crafts. If you've been to Morocco and you've seen the incredible quality of craftsmanship in all materials, that's what they came from. Then they were dumped in this town uh, without access to that, without access to uh, any kind of good jobs, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and what transpired is a, is a sort of a failing town. It's much, much better now. I would say in the last 15, 20 years, it's uh, Bay Chan specifically has done reasonably well. But we were completely oblivious to the fact that six miles away from us, there were families that didn't have enough food for their kids. Um, so that's a brief summary. Okay, so let's see. Uh, this was scheduled for an hour because I know being on Zoom is exhausting. Uh, so if you want to go, sei uh, gesund, which is by the way not an expression that I knew growing up. We didn't know a single word of Yiddish. Um, and thank you for being here. And if you want to stay, we can take a about two more questions, um, if you have any further questions or thoughts about what you heard. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so hi, uh, my name hi, is Sheila. Sheila. Um, my sister lives in Israel, has been there for a probably the last 45 years. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I had the experience of actually um, 
she was married at the time, she's now divorced, but she was married to someone who was the head of the regional field school, Beit mm -hmm. Sada. And where, <clears throat> where are you? And uh, so the kibbutz they were on was Sheyar Yashuv mm -hmm. in the Galil. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the kids were, she had um, uh, two daughters and her son, Ilan, who was, they had a Beit Tinakot. The older kids lived with them, but the babies were still in the Beit Tinakot. And I was visiting her, and I'll never forget um, the difficulty that I had. I was still, you know, in my late teens, I think. Um, <clears throat> but she would have to get up every time the baby would cry and not go back to sleep easily. They would call her, mm -hmm. and she would have to get up in the middle of the night and schlep to the Beitina Kot, mm -hmm. which was quite far away from her. It was like maybe actually in the middle of the night, it was a five minute walk, but even at that. And there were some times where she'd have to go two or three times a night. And I remember thinking to myself, this is absolutely insane growing up in the Canadian, I'm Canadian, the Canadian yeah. culture. Right. Like I, I had a very difficult time understanding right. uh, sort of the philosophy behind it, as well as the fact that I remember the kids all shared their, uh, the undershirts and there was like, nobody had their own clothes. So that was my only experience as you were talking right. about your, how you grew up and being in the Beitina Kod right. and the advantages of it. And yet on the other hand, I thought it was also uh, in some ways in, extremely difficult on the parents, yes. let alone the children. Yes. So. Yeah, so it's like two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, as I said, you have free childcare every single night. And if your baby wakes up and you're okay with somebody else give, giving them a bottle, you get a full night's sleep. Sounds like paradise. On the other hand, as you described, that was not the experience for a lot of mothers, especially, of course, if you wanted to breastfeed, which when I was growing up was not nearly as encouraged and common as it is now. Um, and uh, yeah, and then there, they, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about the clothes. So the reason I read you that little passage about how there were three cubbies, underwear, shirts, right. and pants, that's what it was. So when it was time to get clean clothes, which was Tuesdays and Fridays, well, in kindergarten, it was probably every day. I don't, yeah, in kindergarten, because we spent most of our day in the mud which was, by the way, wonderful. Um, we played in the mud, we had a vegetable garden, we were really dirty, which I think is a wonderful thing to be able to offer children. So after our shower, which was in the afternoon after lunch, there was a, sh there was a shower, everybody showered together, of course, and then we got the caretakers help us get dressed and we had to nap. So they would just take the top shirt that was in the shirt cubby and the top un piece of underwear and the top pants. And if by chance they happen to be way too big for you, then they say, okay, we'll save this for so-and-so is bigger. You get the next one. There were no, there were no private clothes. When I was in uh, fourth grade, I had an uncle in the United States and they would send us packages of care packages of American clothes most of which we wouldn't wear because they were bourgeois, fancy city clothes. But one time a t-shirt appeared and it said, it had like a little emblem with three, with an imprint of three pine trees and it said Pine Grove. And I'd never seen a t-shirt with a design on it. We didn't have, we didn't know that existed. And it, they sent it to me. So I dutifully put it in the laundry with everybody else's clothes, but my friends knew how en enchanted I was by this. So when it would come and it would happen to be their turn, they would say, no, 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 give that to Rachel. She loves this shirt. So I had sort of a privately owned shirt. By the time we were in seventh grade for our bar and bat mitzvah, we were each allowed to pick uh, from three possible fabrics, a fabric that we wanted the kibbutz seamstress to make us a shirt, a, a fancy dress shirt. So that things were getting liberalized and there were some privately owned clothes. But 
other than that pine grove shirt, which I can still see in front of my eyes, it was a dark green with a white ellipse and said pine grove. And I think that was the first words that I learned how to read in English. Um, I don't have any recollection of feeling anything negative about the fact that everybody wore the same clothes. It seemed natural. All the adults were more, wore more or less the same clothes also, except, so as I mentioned to you, my mother was this sort of very independent thinker, iconoclast, which in hindsight, I feel incredibly grateful for and proud of. But at the time, so when I was 15 years old, women started to buy some clothes on occasion out in the city. One day, my mother's on Friday night, which is when all the women dressed up, my mother appears in the dining room wearing bell-bottom pants. Oh my God, I was so embarrassed because she was an old lady, right? She was the mother of three children and teenagers and people in their 20s in Tel Aviv wore bell-bottom pants. Anyway, it took, took about 10 years to recover from that, but eventually I came around to being very proud of it. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Uh, I really appreciated just talking to you. Just a quick question. Yeah, I, yes. Um, with so little uh, adult supervision, how do the kids uh, control their natural egoism uh, and, and help one another in the way that you described? Right, so... Where the ideas from? Yeah, so there were, each kid was their own story and some kids were uh, seen by the class as egotistical and we, we knew that and we were critical of that. The overriding ideology was communitarian. So you have to take care of each other and you shouldn't stick yourself out too much. Um, so for example, I remember very vividly being kind of uh, flabbergasted, I guess is the word, when in second or third grade, my teacher um, said to me, you know, sometimes you shouldn't raise your hand right away. You should let other kids be the first ones to raise your hand. I was very studious and, and quick. She said, you know, sometimes you should let the other kids be the ones to raise their hand first when they know the answer. Um, so it was kind of a blow because it was sort of being called on always sticking my nose out first. Uh, but we really internalized very much the idea that the highest value was um, communal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So there was enough of that from the ambient. Uh, yes, from yes. And it also ruled pretty much the lives of our parents, even though, as I now have said way too many times, my parents really marched to their own drum. Mm -hmm. but, um, but that was unusual. Most mm -hmm. people uh, very much went by whatever the community decided for everybody that, that would, the assumption, at least in the early days, was that the community knows best. Yeah. And that your own personal desires should be subsumed under mm -hmm. communal goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to say if you have more thoughts and questions, you can email me, rachelbl at gmail.com, or just I have a website. You can contact me through the website. It's again, it's just rachelbl.com. So I'd be delighted to continue the conversation if things come up for you that you'd like to talk about. Thank you so much, Rachel. This was a lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Be well.